Welcome everyone to the Staff Pride Network's uh, first event for LGBT History Month, Legal for 40 Years, a snapshot from someone who was there. My name is Katie, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network. I'm really pleased to welcome you all here today um, and particularly excited about the conversation that we're going to have with our fantastic guest, Terry Munyard. Um, and I was going to kick off with quite a general question to ask you to, to tell us a bit more about how you became a lawyer and why. Right. Um, I come from a working class family um, just north of Liverpool. Um, when I say working class, my father was a skilled tradesman and um, he was very left wing, but very, uh, very much an individual. Um, on my mother's side, her father, my granddad, was a Labour politician and a magistrate. And so I must have picked up from him in particular the idea that being a lawyer would be a good career that would be uh, would enable me to both have a, a satisfying career but also to contribute to the public good. I say that, but my granddad had a major stroke when I was nine and never couldn't speak again for the rest of his life. So somehow or other, this message about the um, power and effectiveness of lawyers obviously had got through to me at a very young age. And I certainly wasn't thinking at the age of nine that that's what I wanted to be. But by the time I was about 15 or 16, I had decided that's what I wanted to do. My parents um, devoted their entire lives to making sure their four children got a good education. And um, that, and so we all ended up going to university, three of us straight from school. My twin sister, in, interestingly, didn't go to university until age 47, when she did her first degree <laughs> at that age. So that was the background, um, a left-wing father, um, a labor politician grandparent, and a sense that being a lawyer would actually enable me to do something that was really interesting, but also would have a powerful impact in the community. Now, I became a barrister entirely by, by chance because after I'd done my degree, I was going to go to Johns Hopkins, the American University, their center in Bologna in Italy. They gave me a place to do international relations and they said they would provide a scholarship. The scholarship fell through. Coming from my background, I couldn't afford the bus fare to Dover, let alone cross the channel, pay, pay fees and um, maintain myself there. So I had to do something in a hurry. And in those days, my local authority was willing to pay for me to do the bar course uh, because they treated it as a postgraduate qualification. So I got the qualification of barrister, but I didn't have the connections, the cash or the confidence to actually ever think in terms of practicing. So I ended up working, writing about employment law, but I also became active in CHE, the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, and in the NCCL, which is now called Liberty. Um, and so by my work there, I began to uh, encounter <clears throat> lots more people in the law. But also I had a personal legal experience that was very, very um, formative. I was arrested for gross indecency late one night um, in Hyde Park with another man in the dark off the beaten track prosecuted subsequently had a jury trial for gross indecency and i was acquitted um, but that was a it was a searing but truly formative experience what it also made me realize is that an awful lot of lawyers trendy left-wing lawyers were um, effectively making a name for themselves but not helping their clients in the way in which they um, worked on those cases and so i and another man Ian Davis, who'd been through a similar experience, we set up something called Gay Legal Advice, which was to both support people who were going through the trauma of a trial, but also refer them to, re to decent, committed lawyers. And I started going to court in my capacity as a support to individuals who were on trial, and I started to see how badly they were defended. And through my connections in NCCL, by that time I was on the national executive. I met um, 
Adrian Fulford, who was then a member of Wellington Street Chambers, Britain's only socialist collective of barristers. I know that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it was true. And um, he invited me to apply, and I did apply, and I was taken on. And um, I remember being asked at my interview, do you think you'll make a good barrister? And I said, I've no idea. I've never done it, but I would like to try. And 40 years later, I retired from the same job. Wellington Street, I remained in for another 10 years, and then we dissolved. And I went and joined Garden Court Chambers, which was the chambers I was in until two years ago when I retired. I'm still a door tenant there. I'm still a member, um, but I don't practice anymore. So that's what led, that was my journey to legal practice as a member of the bar. So much in there to, to, to unpack. I, it's, it's amazing hearing your personal experience um, and how that, you use that to, um, I suppose, it sounds almost like a springboard for generating better support for people. I wanted to pick up on what you talked about, the trauma of being subjected to a trial. Could you yes. expand on that a little bit for me? Well, um, obviously the shock of being arrested. You're, you know, I was out at Hyde Park after in Hyde Park after midnight. It was a popular cruising area. Nobody was harming anybody else. You couldn't see what was going on. I knew the police were lying because I knew they couldn't see what we were or weren't doing. Um, but, but two things stand out in my memory. And that was, this was 1976. The first thing is that we were taken off to the police station. And one of the questions that I found particularly distressing, it may sound funny, but I remember being asked, are your teeth your own? You know, I was a 26 year old man and I'm being subjected to these truly unpleasant, intrusive procedures. And then the next morning I was in Bow Street Magistrates Court, in number one court, holding on to the railings in the dock, the very dock Oscar Wilde had stood in. And I remember the courtroom going up and down, up and down like a, as if I was on board a ship. Those are the two things I remember from that night. And then I had to wait a whole year before my trial came on. And I was very worried what was going to happen. Would I lose my job? I wasn't in practice at the bar then. I was a researcher in employment law. But it was to live with that for a whole year was terrible. The, when you get acquitted, it doesn't immediately dissolve all that anxiety and that trauma. That stays with you. It takes a long time to come to terms with the fact that it's all over. It's behind you. And so I wanted to put something back and to try to make sure that didn't happen to other people. Interestingly, three years later, when I joined Wellington Street and became a practitioner, we did we fought lots of cases of that sort where men would otherwise have just pleaded guilty in the hope that, that would get, put an end to it. And the first 10 cases I did of that nature, first 10 jury trials, we won nine. And eventually, by about 1983, the Metropolitan Police in London stopped practicing that, that kind of horrific anti-gay campaign. Easy arrests, but terrible trauma inflicted on the men that they were arresting. It actually did make a big difference. It's not just me, but a, a lot of a lot of people were then beginning to realise you can fight these cases and win. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, you've sort of covered my second question, was which was going to talk about how you got involved in the gay rights movement. But maybe you could tell us a bit more about the, your experience of the movement at that time. So obviously, you were in, you've talked about how you've tried to support people from a legal perspective, but there was obviously a lot of activism going along, going on around that time as well. Yes, I mean, I was already um, on the executive committee of the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, which was very much the, the, the conventional um, <clears throat> establishment, if you like. I'm not knocking them by saying that, but it was very much the establishment campaign in Britain. Um, and I was, you know, meeting, MPs and all that sort of thing. Um, but I was also interested in, in activism and there was a stage, I think in 1979 or 1980, 
when The Guardian of all newspapers published a really unpleasant article around the time of gay pride, sneering at what they called little lesbians. And a group of us, and this is mainly people who'd come out of GLF and who were still in GLF, but I, had, I wasn't a member of Gay Liberation Front, but I had lots of friends and contacts there. And, and through a phone tree, don't forget this is pre-internet, pre-mobile phones, this is, you know, dialing, dialing up. The day the article came out, there were lots of people ringing one another. We met in a pub near the Guardian's offices in Farrington. We cased the joint. We sent out a couple of people to look at the building. And we decided that the next morning we were going to go in and stop the newsroom and demand the right to reply, which is exactly what we did do. Um, so I was, you know, that's the sort of activism that I was also involved in. Uh, we were also active in um, trying to not stop, but trying to counter the effect of the Festival of Light and these Christian anti-gay organisations. So uh, a lot of us would go to their rallies, their meetings, their prayer groups, and we'd stand up and tear out pages of the Bible and um, throw them around and generally kick up a fuss and make people realise that what they were actually doing was preaching hate against ordinary men and women who were now in their midst. So I've always believed very strongly in the need for activism, as well as the conventional establishment route to changing the law and changing people's attitudes and behaviour through changes in the law. And did it was it easy for you to hold those two sort of hats together in, in your career and in, uh, in your activist life? It, it, to be quite honest, I can't remember any sense of conflict between those two roles. I mean, by 1980, I was, uh, I was doing my pupillage, doing my training as a barrister. And so I was dressing up in a suit and a stiff collar and a silk tie and all the rest of it, and indeed in court in a wig and gown. Um, and so I was living what appeared to be a very conventional life. But I was also still very interested in, in any sort of activism that I could get involved in. Um, but I'd, been, I'd also been uh, active prior to that on the in the field of employment law, because before I was in practice at the bar, I'd been working for a company who published fortnightly bulletins about employment law. And these bulletins went to both sides of industry, to the trade unions and to employers. And part of my job was to go and read every single industrial tribunal decision in all four corners of the United Kingdom. They're now called employment tribunals, but the same thing. And I would have to go once a year to Scotland, to Glasgow, where the, the um, headquarters of the tribunals were, um, Belfast, Wales, and of course, London, I could do deal with at home. In going to, when I went to Belfast in particular, I made sure, this is in the mid 70s, I made sure I, I made contact with members of the Northern Ireland Gay Rights Association. And so through them, I met Jeff Dudgeon, who was the claimant in the UK, in Dudgeon and the United Kingdom, the Northern Ireland Gay Rights case. But that connection came about because of my work going to read all the employment tribunal decisions in Belfast. Now, when I then went into practice in 1980, and I was I was training as a barrister, I had the qualification, you have to do the practical training. Jeff Dudgeon's case was about to be heard by the European Court of Human Rights in April 1981. And Jeff said to me in 1980, I'd like you to be my barrister. Well, I was taking my baby steps into the magistrate's court, and he was asking me to go to not just the highest court in the land, but the highest court in Europe. And I said, you, you do not want me to be your lead counsel because I'm just not experienced enough, but I know a man who will, who had been my supervisor and was head of my chambers, Tony Gifford, who is, is a, he's Lord Gifford, he's the eighth Baron Gifford, he's a hereditary peer, but he didn't trade on that very greatly. And I knew that Tony Gifford would be good, but he wasn't gay. And Jeff wanted a gay team. And I said, look, 
you know, this is this is all. I really do think you should use him if you're going to have us as part of your team. And so he assembled a team of myself, Paul Crane, his solicitor, and various other people. Um, and Tony Gifford led the team, but everybody else on it was gay. Um, and so that's how I came to be involved in that case. But my interest in employment law also led me to, uh, and my involvement in the NCCL, um, led me to, first of all, write a pamphlet for NCCL called Gay Workers, Trade Unions and the Law, for which we got Tony Benn to write the introduction, um, which generated a lot more interest in the pamphlet, fortunately. But um, that led us to the reason we're all here tonight, because in 1979, um, a man called John Saunders, who was employed as a boiler engineer and handyman at a, a school a school's camp somewhere in, in the middle of Scotland, was sacked when his employers found out that he'd been to a gay club and asked him if he was gay, and he said yes. And the, he took his case to the industrial tribunal. The tribunal found that his dismissal was fair. And so he appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which is the next stage up. And that's a branch of the High Court. And they also found his, his dismissal to be fair. And they relied, both tribunals relied on the fact that gay sex, sex between men in Scotland, was completely illegal. The 1967 Act which in a very narrow way legalized gay sex in England and Wales, did not apply to Scotland or Northern Ireland. And so in 1980, I was now in practice at the bar, but I was still involved, very much involved in NCCL. We called a meeting at the House of Commons to highlight the decisions of these two tribunals, allowing the dismissal of a man purely on the grounds that he was gay. And a lot of MPs turned up for the meeting. It was, I can't remember exactly when it was. It was probably September, October 1980. And we were discussing uh, what could be done. And there were a small group of Labour MPs at the back of the room. I can still remember one of them saying, hang on a minute, there's a Criminal Justice Scotland bill going through Parliament right now. We could amend it. We could put in a clause to bring the law in line with England and Wales. And that's exactly what they did. And actually the person who tabled the amendment I've since read was Robin Cook. Um, and that amendment, as you all know, went through. And in February, 1981, the law in Scotland was brought into line with the law in England and Wales. Uh, and, and that's what we're celebrating tonight. It, it sort of, uh, I don't know if blows my mind is, is, is totally fair, but it seems almost serendipitous then that it was yes. having the right people in the room at the right time yes. with this bill going through. Was What was the reason for the bill being, was, um, was it being reviewed or was it, um, like, was it a new, completely new bill that was being enacted? The I don't remember any of the details of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill 1980, as it then must have been, um, because I wasn't actually involved in very much criminal law, and I certainly wasn't involved in any criminal law in Scotland. Mm. Um, and it came as a surprise to me, and no doubt to a lot of other people in the room. You're absolutely right. It was completely serendipitous. It was pure chance. We called the meeting, and the meeting happened to be held in the Commons at the time that that bill was being debated in, in the chamber and in the um, committee rooms. And it was that series of coincidences that led to the change in the law. Very different in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland because there um, in the Northern Ireland, Jeff Dudgeon and some of his friends had been arrested some five years earlier. Um, they'd been subjected to all sorts of unpleasant threats of prosecution, although they weren't actually prosecuted. Their homes were searched. I remember Jeff 
telling me one of the things that was taken from his home and held up as an exhibit was an apple core from a waste paper bin. I and mean, they'd been through everything in his house. Um, so he brought a case in the European Court of Human Rights and he probably lodged it in about 1977. In those days, to have a case heard by the European Court of Human Rights, you first of all had to go to what was called the European Commission of Human Rights. It was a two-stage process. The Commission had to approve your case for a hearing by the full court. And he'd got through that by the time we're in 19, by the time I'd met him, he'd, he'd got through the Commission. But it then took another few years for it to get to the court. So that case was rumbling along in the background. People knew about that. Um, whereas the situation in Scotland, I don't think, certainly in the rest of the United Kingdom, I don't think people realise that the situation in Scotland was just as bad as Northern Ireland. The one difference being that the, I think it's the Crown Office in Scotland, had issued a general advice to prosecutors and the police not to prosecute consensual gay sex. But that was just advice. It wasn't a change in the law. Mm. Uh, and it may be for that reason people weren't being persecuted in Scotland in the same way that Jeff Dudgeon and his friends were being persecuted in Northern Ireland, and no doubt in the way that people were being persecuted in the Republic. Because after Jeff's case, or while Jeff's case was, was still in process, David Norris in the Republic of Ireland, who was a senator in, in the Republic, then uh, lodged a, a case of his own at the European Court of Human Rights. And that case was heard the year after Jeff's case. That was in 1982, by which time the European Court had ruled in Jeff Dudgeon's fa favour. And so inevitably, um, the um, Republic of Ireland case was going to succeed. And just for some clarity for the people who maybe aren't familiar with the law as much, um, when when this bill came into law in Scotland and it legalised, it, it meant that you couldn't be prosecuted for being gay or having gay sex. Did that then mean that it, you know, it had the knock-on effect around employment and that it made it, you couldn't be sacked for being gay or did... I, I think um, the argument that w was relied on in the John Saunders and Scottish National Camps case could no longer be relied on. They couldn't, they, no employer could say, oh, well, you know, it's public policy that gay sex is illegal, therefore we're justified in sacking an employee. And I think the reality on, on the ground in practice, people were not then sacked for being gay. Now, we, we did do a second edition of the um, pamphlet in 1983. Um, and that was the pamphlet that we put out in 1981, I think, and then 83. Um, and by then, things were beginning to change. Uh, but can I just say something about the legalisation of gay sex, both in England and Wales and in Scotland and Northern Ireland? The, the 1967 Act, which legalised gay sex for the first time, and it's exactly the same provisions that eventually came into force in Scotland and Northern Ireland, only allowed gay sex on a very narrow basis. What it legalised was sex between two men, only two men. You couldn't have a third party. They had to be over the age of 21. The age of consent for heterosexuals is 16. I think in Northern Ireland it was 17, but in any event, it was a discriminatory age of consent. It had to be in private. Um, and the, you know, the, so for example, I was prosecuted for having sex outside in a park off the beaten track after midnight in pitch black. That was, you know, the police thought it was appropriate to prosecute me for that because their case was that wasn't in private. Um, you couldn't, for example, have, you would be committing an offence if you were at a party and two, two of you, two men, go behind the sofa and have a little fumble on the floor and there are other people in the room who can't even see you. 
that would have been that's illegal that was illegal until i think 2003 when the law was finally um, changed the 2003 act so under the 1967 act the 1981 reforms or 82 reforms in northern ireland 81 reforms in scotland they were very narrow it was a very narrow basis on which gay sex was legalized it was still completely discriminatory and i remember sometime in the 1980s i was asked on to bbc's news night to have a debate with leo absey leo absey was a labor mp a man not encumbered by self-doubt um, who has been one of the people who who put through the 1967 act he was one of its supporters and he was arguing with me in the 80s we didn't we didn't pass this legislation so people could walk down oxford street flaunting themselves you know that was the attitude even on the part of the law reformers and he was still persisting in that nearly 20 years later so um what we got was a big step forward but it was by no means equality um within the activist sphere you can you picked up on this fact that it was not equality but it was a leap forward yeah. was it something that was celebrated oh very much so oh yes i mean it was a huge step forward and i can remember being in the house of commons um, in december i think it was december 92 um, when they debated the Northern Ireland Sexual Offences Order, it was an order in council secondary legislation to actually put into practice the decision of the European Court of Human Rights the year before to, to change the law in Northern Ireland. And there was great celebration when that order finally went through in the teeth of opposition, particularly from some Catholic Labour MPs. Um, I was struck actually in that debate um, the year after we won the case in the European Court, I was struck by the number of liberal Tories who supported changing the law and, and, and reactionary Labour MPs, my own party, who opposed it. So, um, yes, it was celebrated, but people like Peter Tatchell never gave up pointing out this was a very narrow legalization and it was it was nowhere near uh, equality it was a, a tolerance at its absolutely lowest level uh, and it was people like him and a lot of the other glf activists who carried on have always carried on fighting for true equality I mean, one of the bizarre features of the 1967 act was that it legalized gay sex as i've told you in this very narrow way but there was a specific section of the act that said none of this applies to merchant seamen on board merchant ships and um, how do you explain that it's it, it shows you how narrow-minded the legislatures were they they'd obviously got their knickers in a twist and decided that if you're away on a ship you know taking freight from here to singapore um, that you're going to corrupt all the other sailors on board and so they actually actually explicitly said the act doesn't apply on board merchant navy ships uh, and in that context the act didn't apply in that you couldn't be gay and serve in the navy then on a uh, merchant navy ship no no you could be gay but you couldn't have sex oh i see with an with another member of the merchant navy yeah. on board your ship okay. and of course um gay sex in the in the forces the armed forces the royal navy and the army and the air force that wasn't legalized until quite a lot later mm. um so there's a question that came through in ahead of the event which speaks to a lot of the things we've been discussing um this is from someone who i think is in the audience um and they're asking about was the pursuit of the legal achievement the only focus or what attempts were made to have a true two-pronged account to align with education and anti-stigma campaigns well, um, it, I think it depends very much who you are. If you're one of the campaigning gay and lesbian rights organizations, then you were campaigning on several fronts at once, obviously. Um, 
individuals might have decided I'm going to work on this campaign only. This is what is most important to me. Um, but that sort of brings us to clause that section 28, because um, section 28 was a classic example of how you can you can achieve uh, success and, and victory on one level. So we have the we have these advances in the criminal law relating to gay men in the in 1967 and then the early 80s scotland and northern ireland but by the mid 80s 1987 um, there's a backlash and so we saw section 28 being enacted by the thatcher government um, section 28 of the local government act which prohibited local authorities from quotes promoting homosexuality in schools and in other uh, other areas that um, where they had jurisdiction. And Margaret Thatcher in particular, I've got a quote from, from Thatcher. She said um, at the time, if you'll bear with me for just a second. Yes, she said, um, children who, who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. All of those children are being cheated of a sound start in life. Yes, cheated. And so as a result of that, we ended up with section 28 on the statute books. So a lot of us were involved in campaigning against section 28 because of the, the stultifying effect the numbing effect it would have on local authorities. Many, many progressive local authorities um, were trying to widen out uh, uh, their um, support of lesbian and gay and transgender, all, all the LBTQ, et cetera, um, communities. They were, they were trying to actually make specific provision for them. And section 28 was brought in I think uh, in response to that, because um, re reactionary people saw that this might actually empower those of us who had traditionally not been empowered and not been treated equally. Now, the curious thing about that section was that it never actually led to any prosecutions. But what it did do was it put a dampener on a lot of the local authorities' willingness um, they became risk averse. They would not fund organizations. For example, I was asked to, to give a, a legal advice, which I did do for a housing association that was providing housing to vulnerable young lesbians and gay men. Um, and they were they would have to apply for funding from local authorities and they were worried that the effect of Section 28 mean, meant that the local authorities would be obliged to say no we can't fund you um, but what i was able to advise was no this is not promoting homosexuality this is promoting safe housing for people who are vulnerable and you're you know you can take this advice to any local authority who you're seeking funding from and tell them they're not at risk of being prosecuted but that was the problem that it, it created an atmosphere of fear and it lasted on the statute books until actually Scotland, to its credit, Scotland was the first country in the United Kingdom to abolish Section 28. It did so in 2001. England and Wales didn't catch up till 2003. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I've properly answered the question that was asked, but I, I hope I've been able to show how you know, what we've been doing was was wider simply than allowing gay men to have sex together no, without it's... a policeman appearing in the bedroom window <laughs> very very useful to have brought up section 28 actually and i think it leads quite nicely into the second part of this question which was asking around how like if, if we were running a legal campaign now in a jurisdiction where it's required other things that you would i mean I suppose it's difficult with this the Scotland situation being so serendipitous, but are there any specific things you would do, any advice you would give? Um, you know, do you imagine it being easier because of social media and we don't need to do phone trees nowadays? Um, 
in some ways it's easier with social media um, in other ways it was it's harder because social media has opened up as we've seen in the united states in particular um, to much more hate um, messaging and and misinformation so um, it, the only advice i would give and i'm not claiming to have all the answers or indeed many of the answers but I do believe very firmly in the need for both activism and what you might call mainstream campaigning. So yes, have your law reform campaigns and, and, and all of those things, the things I was particularly involved in, but also keep up the activism. The activism, I think, is what makes the legal campaigning um, work. Um, as for social media, I'm now going to declare myself a complete dinosaur I'm not on and never have been on any. Um, but I mean, that, that, that sounds like direct action in itself, <laughs> being yes, being ab abstaining from social media entirely. Um, I just want to remind everyone in the audience that you're very welcome to post in the chat any questions or comments that you would like to share. Um, I've just spotted a couple, which I'll pick up on. Um, one is a message from, now I'm going to attempt what I think is a pronunciation of this name, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's Gronia. it's an Irish name, um, yes. saying, Terry, you're an inspiration to us all, your human rights work throughout your career, and applause message. Um, and we have one from Shireen picking up on your comments about section 28, saying that, um, I started teaching around the time Section 28 came in. As I recall, there weren't many local authorities or schools doing much. They, we, were the exception, not the rule. I was in a school which was already doing work on lesbian and gay rights. We realised the section was unworkable. It applied to local authorities, not school governors. So we went right on doing it. It was only a small group of schools already doing that work and it didn't stop us. The chilling effect happened later. As attitudes changed in the 90s, some schools and teachers started to want to introduce education on lesbian and gay rights, but felt inhibited. Yes. Yes, I mean, what, what Shireen says there is absolutely right. The section itself was unworkable as a tool with which to batter local authorities, um, but it was very successful as a tool with which to numb and, and dumb down local authorities, interfering that if they continued with this sort of provision, um, that, uh, that they would be closed down or prosecuted or whatever. Uh, and uh, obviously, it, I've just seen a question, a point that's just been made. Yes, it's obviously bound to have had a particularly bad effect on any lesbian or gay teacher or trans teacher who would be afraid that they were going to be seen as promoting homosexuality. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw an article just yesterday talking about a, a head teacher in a, a private school in England who was planning to come out today to his school as, as, as a gay man, happily married gay man, um, in sort of in celebration of LGBT History Month. But the fact that that's still news today really shows you the legacy of the of Section 28. Yes, yes. Um, um, well, English law um, moves very slowly. And I'm going back now for a moment to the criminal law. Um, I was looking through some papers earlier, thinking about tonight's discussion. And um, I remembered that Archbold, which is the criminal lawyer's Bible, um, Archbold always used to have in the index at the back, if you were looking up offences, it used to have a section called unnatural offences. And to my and they include buggery and gross indecency, the charge I was I had to face. This is the 2003 edition of Archbold, and still in 2003 the year that the Sexual Offences Reform Act went through, they still had unnatural offences in the index. I mean, oh. it, it shows you it takes an awful lot to change legal attitudes and, and people's approach. But a huge amount has changed. Uh, and I mean, for example, one is, um, I, I'm, I'm amazed to say it is the Tories bringing in gay marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I think, the only achievement of David Cameron's government. 
achievement, um, but it was an achievement. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there have been big changes. We are moving very significantly towards e equality, but we're not by any means there yet. And the real lesson of, of uh, Section 28 is you always have to be ready for the for the, the opposition to return to the fight and to try and turn back the tide of history. Absolutely. We, we always have to be ready for um, <clears throat> uh, to defend the rights that we've worked so hard to achieve. Um, I'm going to pick up on a question in the chat and then I'll come to David to ask if we have any of any anonymous questions as well. So this is from Sean saying three questions, but if if only you have time for one, have you ever considered writing about this? It's so important to have a record of this history. And thankfully, we are recording tonight's session, so there will be a record of what we've talked about. Um, Sean says, I believe later this year, Queer Britain History Museum will open in London. Also, if someone sought your advice about effective activism, given your past experience, what would you say? Oh, we've got something here. There's Queer Britain's brochure. Oh, um, yes, I've been I've been slightly involved. A friend of mine who died two years ago, um, we left, uh, and I was one of his executors. We left some of his money to Queer Britain to help them set up the museum. I think that's very important. Have I considered writing? Well, one day if I get the time, I will. I mean, I do think it's important that it's, that it's written. And I'm sorry, Sean, I didn't get the last part of the question. It was asking about. Um... If someone sought your advice about effective activism, what would you say, given your past experience? Um, do what you can to avoid being arrested. Uh, don't be afraid to run away if, 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 if it means you're not going to be arrested. Um, uh, prepare properly. Cover the ground. Do the research. Find out where you're going, what you're going to be doing, what the potential hazards are. Excellent um, advice. Can I just say something else about um, the way I've approached my work? I mean, one of the great things about when I joined Wellington Street Chambers was, this is 1980, I applied to that set of barristers chambers on the basis that I was a gay rights activist. And that was my USP, my unique selling point. And it was on that basis that I was taken on. And that gave me great confidence. And I'm not a naturally confident person. And so in the mid 1980s, during the miners' strike, 1984 to 5, a number of us from Wellington Street and other firms of solicitors and other barristers went up and we were billeted with striking miners' families in the Nottinghamshire coal field. And we went to court every day representing the striking miners. And we ended up doing long trials the following year, riot trials, in which everyone, everyone was acquitted. Um, but the striking miners, in Nottinghamshire were not used to having a gay man staying in their spare bedroom or sleeping on the couch. Um, and because I had the support of my colleagues and I had Chambers backing, I felt able to go there and be completely myself. And I remember being in Nottingham Crown Court one day and in going into the robing room where you get into all the ridiculous gear and get out of it again at the end of the day. And some of the local members of the bar pinning themselves against the wall as I came in and one said, oh, here comes our red friend, no doubt going home to his um, to his suburb on his proletarian bus. That person subsequently became a judge. Uh, but that was the sort of stuff that we were subjected to for representing striking miners in the mid 1980s. Uh, and you know, having, the, having the support of my colleagues meant that I was able to deal with that kind of abuse. And also it meant that I was able to be much more myself, openly gay in communities where they'd never knowingly met a gay man before. So having a support network is absolutely vital as well. Thank you. Um, David, I just want to come to you quickly in case there's any questions that pick up on different areas that we haven't maybe covered yet. 
Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm conscious I've not uh, introduced myself uh, to, to members of our audience tonight. So um, just by way of a, a brief introduction, my name's David, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I'm the social and events officer of the, the Staff Pride Network. Um, I, I just wanted to, to take a moment to, to thank you so much, Terry and uh, Katie, for uh, an incredibly interesting discussion this evening. Um, and also, if, if I can just say, as a, as a gay man and a, a lawyer in today's legal profession, I, I, I just wanted to extend my thanks to you, Terry, for your legal activism and advancing the rights of the LGBT plus community and also those who, who worked alongside you. Um, just in terms of uh, other questions that, that uh, we can pick up on, um, uh, I know in, in the chat we, we have a question from uh, Brian um, just asking what, what help is ongoing for Commonwealth countries uh, that got uh, uh, stuck with the anti-gay laws? Uh, are you asking me what I can contribute to that? Um, very little, I'm afraid, apart from the, the <clears throat> uh, saying that the Peter Tatchell Foundation um, has been in the past and may well still be quite in, well, very involved in supporting the um, campaigners in, in the Commonwealth countries who are being subjected to terrible um, oppression and, and literally um, physical violence and in some case murder um, in many Commonwealth countries now. Um, Uganda is a particular case in point as is Jamaica um, and I think that is an area that we really ought to be focusing on far more. Um, some of you may remember Peter Tatchell was famously beaten up by Robert Mugabe's henchmen when he tried to stop Mugabe's car coming through London some years ago. Mm. Um, and he, ha again, <clears throat> as with all the things he's involved in, he hasn't given up, he carries on doing that. And the Peter Tatchell Foundation certainly is a very good organisation to support and get involved in. Uh, but I think if we are looking now to, to um, deal with critical um, areas of um, LGBT, oppression, then the Commonwealth countries is, a, is perhaps a very good place to start or to ramp up the campaigning and put pressure on this dreadful United Kingdom mm -hmm. government to do more about it. Yeah, so, thank you very much for, for, for that, Terry. I, I, I kind of echo that sentiment. I think that when when we're thinking about um, the, the kind of uh, legal activism that we can get involved in, I think uh, there, there may be a tendency for people to to just kind of think on a jurisdiction kind of basis, but it's it's really important that, that we actually um, consider what we can do um, on a on a wider scale and and other countries that, that we can help in our legal activism. Um, just picking up on on another uh, couple of questions that, that were submitted to us on our forum, uh, I, I'll move to to a question um, asking uh, what what the most frustrating thing is that, that, that you haven't yet been able to change despite maybe maybe trying? Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's very frustrating as a lawyer to be constrained by the rules of court. You can't say what you really want to say. But that's, uh, that's a frustration that I faced almost every day in um, in my legal practice, not just in relation to uh, LGBT rights and and um, you know queer people's rights um, that arose everywhere. And the last case that I did, I represented one of the Stansted 15, 15 courageous people who stopped an aircraft taking off with refugees and asylum seekers attempting to deport them back to West Africa. Um, and uh, the, the trial was two years ago, and um, they were all convicted by a jury in Essex. Uh, on Friday, the Court of Appeal in England uh, quashed those convictions, which was a fantastic result. But what I really want to say about that case is um, I wanted just to deal with the politics of what these people were doing, they were they were basically highlighting the iniquity of the British 
uh, Home Office in the way it dealt with asylum seekers and refugees, people who, who'd been within an inch of their lives, people who'd been terrorised, people who'd been tortured, coming to our shores and attempting to restart their lives and the way they were being bussed back like cattle in these chartered aircraft back to West Africa. And I, I wanted to be able to say that in the end, in my closing speech, I was able to be much more political to the disgust of the judge and the prosecution. Uh, and sadly, as it turned out, to the disgust of the jury. <laughs> but um, it, it is very frustrating as courtroom lawyer a lot of the time, particularly dealing in jury trials, um, to, to be able to be yourself and to say what you really think and believe. You are very much constrained by the rules of the court. And in a case, particularly a case involving a, a significant number of defendants, it's always useful to have one, one or more defendant representing themselves because they're able to get away with a lot more than one of the lawyer, one of the advocates is able to do. And we had that happen also in the Stansted 15 case. But we also had it happen in the minor's trial and we've had it happen in other, other cases I've been involved mm -hmm. in. I mean, I've represented, uh, over the years, I've represented people who've been um, members of the IRA, people who've been in other sorts of terrorism trials and so on. Um, and if they are really articulate uh, and they have a strong political position, um, then it's always useful to have at least one defendant represent themselves because they can do what we can't do as lawyers. But of course, as lawyers, we're also much more experienced at knowing what not to ask and when not to speak. Mm -hmm. But sorry, that's a very legalistic answer to what I think was a much more general question. Um, I can't think off the top of my head right now uh, without access to gin and tonic what, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what other frustrations there have been over, over the last 40 years. I think it takes us quite nicely into the question that's just been posted in the chat, which we could maybe end on, although I know you've got time. So if, if people do want to stay sure. and continue the discussion after seven o'clock, that's fine. Um, which is Rowan, who has asked, what do you think are the most pressing legal issues facing LGBT people in the UK at the moment? Uh, I think that um, trans rights in particular is, is an extremely pressing issue. Um, I don't think it's easy, uh, and I don't think it's completely black and white. Well, I think it's quite black and white that people should be able to declare themselves their gender. Um, but I think there's a lot of nuances um, that need to be addressed by everybody. It, it, on, I, I wouldn't say both sides of the argument. I think there's more than two, um, two corners to this particular square. Um, but I, I think that that's an area where, in particular, the Tories are gearing up to try to create culture wars around that issue. So it's going to be used as a stick, not just to bash transgender people with, but also um, anyone, anyone who supports them. Um, it's, I also think that we need to be on guard because of what's been happening in Eastern Europe and what's been happening in the United States, I think there may well be a backlash in this country against our rights. And I think we have to be really well prepared to deal with, with that. I mean, it sounds, I almost can't believe I'm saying that, but after what we've seen in, in the last 12 months in Europe and the last 12 days or more in the United States, um, we have to be vigilant. We can't. We can't assume that it's all going to be a, a, a forward progression. To ask maybe a, a practical thing, then, what does being vigilant look like for people um, who care? I, uh, I think. I think part of the answer to all of these issues is to be out, to be ourselves, um, to be visible, and. It's very easy for me to say that. It's not nearly so easy for hundreds, and if not thousands, of other people to say that, particularly if you're young. Um, uh, uh, and 
you're worried about what the impact is going to be on your family, your friends, your employment, your career prospects and all the rest of it. Um, but I must say, going on my own experience, you know, when I was 29 when I applied or 30 when I applied to join Wellington Street Chambers, I did it with a, a sense of trepidation, but I made it plain that I was a gay man. And to my great relief, um, I was not just accepted, but they saw that as something that was really important for Chambers to um, support and to and to move forward with. Um, so I think having support networks is vital, um, but above all, being out, being open, being brave. Um, one of the things that does, of course, is it, it, it actually makes some people who might not previously have realized that you are the them that they're talking about, um, that actually it's another human being who they know or who they can see deserves respect. Um, that sort of individual personal example, I think, does carry a lot of weight. It may all sound a bit touchy-feely and not um, exactly activist and campaigning, but it, it is part, it's all part of the package. It makes me think of that sort of oft, often used activist phrase, which is if you, um, if you, like, it's if you challenge my existence, ex expect my resistance. Exactly. Yes. Um, and yes. I wanted to also pick up on David's comment on how valuable it is for him as a gay man, as a lawyer, to see someone like you and to to see, you know, the involvement that you've had over the years. That your visibility has real meaning and. Um, I'm really grateful um, that you were able to give up the time today to talk to us because it is, has been really, really powerful, I think, for everybody in the audience to listen to your stories and to hear your involvement. I think as well, seeing how your commitment to LGBT rights has also kind of spilled over into social justice because LGBT rights is social justice. Yes. It's, a, it's a huge tenet of, of progress um, in this country, but you know, your involvement with supporting striking minors and then with the Stansted 15 um, kind of gives us really full picture of, of how applicable these um, actions and involvements are um, in progressing towards equality. So thank you, thank you so much. Well, um, I, I'd like to thank you, Katie, for inviting me and Raya, who's somewhere in the audience, who was the original contact. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to talk to you about my life. I mean, it never occurred to me I'd had a, a life that was worth spending an hour talking about. And, and then I went back over. Uh, funnily enough, I've been clearing out my cupboards that you can see behind me, the yellow cupboards, because they're full of case papers and that sort of stuff that I no longer need. And in there, I'm finding all sorts of things that a lot of the documents that I worked on at the time on the issues we've been talking about tonight were all tucked away in there. Quite a lot of things I'd completely forgotten about. I'd been a go-between between between the police and witnesses to the murder of two gay men at one stage because the witnesses were too afraid of being prosecuted by the police if they just turned up at a police station. And through Gay Times, we put out an ad saying, if they meet with me, I met with them and police officers in St. James's Park in the open air to make sure that there was no possibility of them being carted off and arrested. That's the sort of thing I'd completely forgotten about, but looking through my papers to prepare for tonight, I was reminded about things like that. So you've given me a, a great opportunity to review um, my own personal history and, and I'm very touched by it. I'm also touched by all the support I keep. Oh yeah, don't, someone's just said, don't throw anything away, too late. Uh, <laughs> I've still got quite a lot of it. I've still got quite a bit. That's very pleasing to hear that this has been a catalyst and has been useful for you as well because I think we're really um, privileged to have you here with us. I think if we have a little bit of time there's just one other thought that has come to me based on a few comments I've seen and also your mention of visibility. Um, you don't know how much TV you watch but there's been a new series on Channel 4 called It's a Sin. Yes. Have you seen it? Uh, we are watching it here at home, but only one episode at a time. Okay, it's well, too I, painful to binge watch. 
I completely understand that. And I won't talk about it in any detail, but I wanted to use it as an example of visibility because I think yes. something I've noticed in, in watching it and then it was actually, I started getting recommended to watch it by straight friends of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really, it really spoke to me because they're clearly waking up to these things because it's becoming this mainstream mm -hmm. conversation, if that makes sense, which yes. is something that was so buried. Um, very much so. Funnily enough, in, in, in amongst these papers, I found one where I had written the first article on HIV, AIDS and employment law. Nobody had written about that before this article I wrote in, I think, 1987. Um, yes, in, I don't even know what the journal is. It's September, 19, September, October 1987, AIDS, the workplace and the law. And as a result of writing that, I was then invited to be part of the British um, group who went to the World Health Organization and the International Labour Organization Joint Symposium on HIV AIDS in the Workplace in 1988. And they, that was um, when they first laid down some general uh, United Nations principles of how to deal with HIV and AIDS in the workplace. So yes, there's. It, I think once you get involved, it's difficult not to turn your hand to all, all aspects of of all the fights that are going on. But what you also have to be careful to do is not to spread yourself too thinly. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's hard. You know, once you start learning something, you pull at a thread, and it's actually. Uh, yes. I think my boss uses the analogy that it's a cold, like a cold bowl of spaghetti. You can't actually find one end, and actually sometimes you pull so hard and it just hits you in the face. Um, so yes, don't know if that speaks to anybody else. Um, I want to thank everyone again for for your time and and joining us today, um, and to say that there are other events that we're running throughout LGBT History Month from the Staff Pride Network. Um, organized by our fantastic events uh, volunteers, David and Siobhan um, are very instrumental in putting these events together, um, as well as support from Robbie and my fantastic co-chair, Jonathan. Um, so please check out our events page on Eventbrite. Um, you can follow at UOE Staff Pride on Twitter and various other social medias as well. Um, but yes, thank you all for, for staying a little bit late as well. Um, and I uh, look forward to seeing many of you at our future events too. Thank you. And thank you so much, Terry. Um, really appreciate it. It's been Again, good to meet you. Thank you. And thank you to all the people who've been sending pop-up notes that keep appearing at the bottom of my screen. I am, I am truly touched. <laughs> I'm glad. I think it's, it's very deserved. And we'll also be working on a Wikipedia article about you. Um, right. as, as part of one of our many Wikipedia Editathon events. Um, and Terry has also being, as, 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 as I sense quite the selfless person, has name dropped a number of other people who've been involved very actively in um, campaigning around and supporting LGBT rights. So we're hoping to bring in more people for future events. Oh, um, very much so. Yes, I, I hope that you will. I'm sure you will follow up on those who I've... Yes, um, I've... <clears throat> already so, sent an email to Nettie today, um, a an area particular of interest to me. And I think something that has been brought up again by watching It's a Sin is the, in the role of, of women, queer women in supporting and, and promoting uh, gay rights during HIV, HIV AIDS crisis. I think it's something that is often not really mentioned or overlooked, not given yes. much of a story to. So yes. um, hopefully we'll be able to give more of a voice to those women in the future. Um, sure and hear their stories as well. Okay, well, again, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you. Um, please go and have your dinners and, and get that G&T. <laughs> yes, yes this, is, this is the tea without the G, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> it says knocking it over. Right. I think um, somebody has found the reference to your paper. Oh, uh, really? Possibly, but we, we'll, we'll add that to the event description. Any, um, Fine, good. Uh, Manyad, AIDS, the workplace and the law, equal opportunities reviews. Ah, that was what it was. EOR, I couldn't work, I couldn't remember what it was. Yes. yes. Um, I think that's Sharon Cowan. 
giving yes. she's a, a professor of feminist and queer legal studies at the university of edinburgh so sort of she's Thank being a, a, a swat there figuring out the reference for everybody <laughs> thanks thanks sharon <laughs> thank you all again okay so i'm thanks. i am going to go and have my dinner now yes have a lovely evening thank you thank bye you bye. same to everybody bye <laughs>